There you go. And hopefully that's coming across fine for everybody. <clears throat> so um, thank you very much for, for that introduction. And, and um, uh, as Mark said, I'm, I'm uh, Nathan Holbert. I'm an associate professor of communication, media, and learning technologies design, a very long uh, title. I, I don't know that I get to claim all of those things individually, but maybe together perhaps. Uh, and I'm an associate professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. It's a real honor to be able to be here with you all today at Atlas and uh, at the University of Colorado. I hear that there was a lot of snow, so maybe, uh, as Ellen mentioned, maybe it's appropriate for me to be here uh, as my, my lab is called the Snow Day Learning Lab. So maybe the, <laughs> the weather has aligned uh, with this talk, perhaps. Um, the talk I'm going to give today is called Making the Future, Constructionist Tools for Critical Reflection and Social Action. And my, my goal today, my, my hope today is to just give you a sense of some of the range of research that I do uh, at the Snow Day Learning Lab with my students. And also hopefully to kind of contextualize why I think uh, educational research in particular is incredibly important for many of the challenges that we're facing today. Um, before I get too far into it though, I wanna sort of acknowledge the many different collaborators that I get to work with uh, in these different research projects that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, and, and in particular, my students that are part of the Snow Day Learning Lab, uh, it's a real pleasure to get to sort of think with them, design with them, uh, and write with them. And, and you know, they're, they're really kind of central to um, all of this work being able to happen that I, that I do and that I'll share with you today. One of the things that we like to do in the Snow Day Learning Lab, uh, at least, you know, once a year or so, is sort of take a step back from all the data collection, all the analysis that we're doing, all the writing that we're doing, and just try to make take a moment to sort of reflect on the state of the world, to, to think about what's happening beyond the walls of the university and the institution, and, and think about how our work might be related to what's happening in the world. And I'll be honest, uh, <laughs> the world is a total mess. The past few years that we've been doing this, it feels like uh, everything seems to be getting worse and worse and, and going wrong, right? I mean, Racism is having this, this horrifying renaissance lately. Um, police violence, despite all the many efforts that have been done over the past few years, seems to be getting worse. Uh, I'm able to talk with you all today using you know, great technology like Zoom, but you know, I'm not able to be there because we're all in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, of course, the planet itself seems to be warming past a point uh, of, of sort of sustainability. Uh, there, there's so many different challenges and issues that we're facing as a society and a species. And these are not new issues, um, but it does feel like for every step forward we take on these, we tend, we tend to be taking two steps back as well. Each of these challenges are complex and they're multifaceted. They have multiple dimensions. But I also feel like each of them have a very important educational component, right? Whether we're trying to ensure that everyone understands basic biology uh, to know what a virus is, to understand what mutations are and, and how vaccines work, or whether we're just trying to ensure that we have a society of people that value life, that value others despite the color of their skin. Now, obviously, uh, I'm not going to stand up here and suggest that my research is solving all of these problems that we're facing. That would be uh, even more egotistical than I can claim. But I do bring these up because I think that all of us that our academics, all of us that are researchers um, that spend time in these institutions really need to take these moments to reflect on how our research is impacting and chipping away at these issues that we all face. I think it's really important for us to do that. And I come from a STEM background. I was a, a high school chemistry teacher for many years. A lot of my research is in sort of STEM domains as you'll, as you'll see today. But I just don't think the solution to these problems is just stemming harder, you know, like doubling down on teaching the scientific method. And if we do that hard enough, if we do that well enough, we'll suddenly sort of solve global warming. I just don't think that's the solution. Certainly, innovations in the STEM domains are going to be a part of addressing some of these global challenges like climate change and, and social instability. But we also know that innovation in itself and when it's driven by you know, a, a narrow and privileged and homogenous class of people, also tends to result in new challenges and new barriers for the most vulnerable. So for that reason, my research really does situate at this intersection uh, between connecting learners to powerful STEM practices, such as computational literacy and, and, and data sciences I'll talk with you about today, um, but also in expanding our ideas of what STEM can be by democratizing access to these spaces and to these domains of practice. And I know I've got them listed separately here, but I really see these as two 
intersecting activities that we need to be engaged in. Um, <clears throat> that when we expand the values and the priorities of science and technology by diversifying the voices and the faces, uh, the voices and faces of people that have always been around here, but have been, you know, in many cases, intentionally silent, silenced or excluded from these domains of practice, that when we, <clears throat> when we engage these people in, in being part of STEM domains, we also create opportunities for learners to engage deeply with not only the existing STEM tools and practices, but also to begin inventing new ones. And I think that's going to be necessary for us to create a more equitable and a just society for everybody. Now, I do this work um, primarily by designing and studying constructionist tools, toys, and spaces. So um, if you're not familiar with constructionism, Mark mentioned the term a little bit ago, uh, but this is really kind of a design paradigm that invites learners to construct personally interesting or communally important artifacts to take their thinking and externalizing it into objects and materials, um, and, then, and then representing those constructions to other people, presenting those constructions to other people so that they can view them, debug them, remix them, share them, uh, all that good stuff. So constructionist spaces are spaces that invite learners to play with ideas. Uh, they give learners room to explore and create and to tinker and iterate. They also uh, are about inviting young people to leverage their unique perspectives, uh, their interests and their values to ask questions that they care about or to ask questions that matter to their community. And constructionist tools are about empowering learners to be creative agents of change. And I wanna come back to this intersection here, this idea of connecting learners to powerful ideas uh, in STEM practices uh, and also democratizing access to these spaces and these domains of practice. One area where I think uh, this, this idea is really represented quite well is around data and data analysis. So this is a representation that I don't know if you're as, uh, <laughs> if you've spent as much time with this representation as I have, but I suspect all of us are familiar with what we're looking at here. These, these representations of, of new uh, COVID cases, right? Um, knowing something about data and data analysis is really important for us to make sense of what these representations are trying to tell us. So for example, we need to know something about what data is represented in these graphs. And to do that, we also need to know something about how that data was collected. And knowing something about how the data is collected also tells us a little bit about what data is not being represented in these graphs and, and why it might not be represented in these graphs. Um, you know, how are we gonna make meaning out of the various peaks that we see here, the, the different slopes for each of those, the different sizes of those peaks? What kind of inferences can we draw, not just from the top, graph that we see here, but from each of them and across these various representations. That idea about sort of understanding something about data and data analysis is really important to draw meaning from this, which in turn, as, as all of us know all too well, is important for just functioning in our daily life these days. But there's more to this, right? Um, right now, the world is kind of increasingly driven by data. Each time we talk, each time we visit a website, data is being collected and algorithms are, are working on that data to draw inferences from that data about us, about who we are, about what kind of information we have access to or should have access to, ways we can communicate, uh, and even in some cases where we can move virtually and also physically. So functioning and existing in this society that we have today um, requires that we have some capability of understanding data and how these algorithms function. And I think also increasingly it's important that not only do all of us have that capability, but we also need to be able to have an opportunity to push back on these algorithms, to challenge them, and in many cases, create new ones that better represent the world and the society that we want to have. Now, the good news is there are lots of efforts that are underway currently around connecting all people, young people in particular, to some of these practices, in particular around computer science education. In New York City, we have one called uh, CS for All, and the goal of this initiative is to ensure that all public school students in New York City have computer science experiences in elementary, middle, and high school. And data and data analysis is part of this kind of computer science collection of ideas. Um, a lot of this is about sort of how does a computer or how do computational systems collect data? How does it store it? How does it transform and, and uh, that data into different types of visualizations? And then of course, also how can we draw inferences or use computational systems to draw inferences from that data as well? Now, as I said, uh, New York City has these initiatives. And so now all of a sudden, uh, there's all these teachers that are starting to teach computer science in their classrooms across the city. And many of these teachers are not computer science teachers. They 
might've been math or science teachers. Some of them are history teachers that just happen to have some of these capabilities. And so uh, there's this sort of big effort to not only support teachers in their teaching, but also support them in their, in their kind of instruction and in their assessment as well about what students are learning in their classes. Uh, so to this end, uh, I have a, a, a grant funded by the National Science Foundation called the Playful Formative Assessment for Computer Science in New York City Project. Uh, this is a, a big collaboration uh, with Daisy Rutstein at SRI, Matthew Berlin at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, Betsy DeSalvo at Georgia Tech, and Jeremy Rochelle at uh, Digital Promise as well as my students, Marlene Villaroy and Saras Thanaporn sang Um, All of us working together to think about how can we support teachers who are just now starting to engage in these data and data analysis, instructional uh, uh, activities in their classrooms. And in particular, our goal was to think about how we could create a set of design frameworks or theories around engaging learners in thinking about and with data doing that in a playful way, in a culturally relevant way, um, but also so such that the, those playful experiences that the, these young people would be engaged in would also generate information that teachers could use uh, to understand what their students were learning or, or, or not learning about data and data analysis. Now, anytime I do this kind of work, uh, it's always really important for me to sort of first step back and figure out, well, what, what are people doing <laughs> with data and data analysis to begin with, what are teachers understanding about these practices? How do they talk about them? What language do they even use to describe them? And what are the particular needs that they have uh, with this area? So, so our first step was to engage in participatory design um, to talk to teachers and to talk to stakeholders about their practices. We had interviews with teachers across the city to find out uh, how they were using data in their classrooms currently, uh, what the challenges that they were facing are, and we talked to not just computer science and math and science teachers, but also history teachers and music teachers and gym teachers. And we found that they were all engaging with data in all sorts of interesting ways, though they weren't always sure whether or not the ways they were engaging with it was connected to what these you know, um, standards were suggesting they should be doing. So that was an important conversation to have. We also talked with students uh, to try to find out like, how are they thinking about data? And, and also, as I said, we wanted to create a playful experience a culturally relevant experience. So we also asked them about you know, how do they spend their free time? What kinds of things do they care about? What kinds of things are they really invested in and, and really um, engaged in as a group of teens, you know, as a group of young people? Uh, and we found in this particular case, we found that students were really interested in video games, not terribly surprising, but also really interested in music. They talked a lot about sharing music, uh, listening to music while they played games, you know, talking about music. And so these ended up being, I think, pretty important kind of areas of interest uh, for young people. This led us to build a, a formative assessment game, uh, a game that students would find fun to play, but it would also provide information to teachers about what they were learning uh, and, and uh, specifically about what they were learning about data and data analysis in their classrooms. Because this game needed to function in New York City schools, it needed to work on really bad Wi-Fi and really cheap laptops and Chromebooks and things. So those were like important design constraints that were part of what we were doing here. Oops, I forgot to press this button earlier. Ta -da. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that we did um, is that after we sort of had a sense of the space that we were designing and we embarked on a design-based research project here. I suspect most of you are familiar with design-based research, but if you're not, uh, this is a methodology that involves uh, iterative processes with a goal of producing and honing theories as well as practical models, things that can actually work in, in the real world, in our case, in classrooms. And for this project, we were doing design-based research to hone theories about building formative and playful assessment design. So we conducted multiple cycles of small-scale testing. We did think-alouds with students to try to understand how they were making sense of um, the various kinds of interactions that we, we were starting to test out in this game space. Uh, and we also then did two uh, large-scale classroom implementations as well. And all of this was with a game that we called Beats Empire. So Beats Empire is a game for providing formative feedback on how middle school students are understanding data and data analysis. And I wanna talk you through some of the features and some of the designs of this game, but I also wanna do that by situating it in uh, a design framework that both, if you're familiar with design-based research, it both sort of came from our analysis of the data, but it also fed into our design. So this is sort of a cyclical process of theory building and design happening at the same time. So the first, uh, feature of this uh, game-based formative assessment framework 
is that uh, the gameplay itself should be interesting and culturally relevant to students. The topic, the activity that the game sort of is organized around should be something that matters to students. It should be connected to things that they care about. Uh, and it should also tap into the rich knowledge that kids already have about all sorts of different stuff. We wanted them to be able to bring that, that experience and that knowledge into the game space. And so Beats Empire is a game uh, that puts the player in the role as a uh, manager of a music studio. And as the manager of this music studio, they get to make decisions about what artists they want to sign, what kinds of songs they want to release. Uh, and they do all of this by, by querying data in this fictional New York City about what listeners are interested in. And that brings me to the, sort of the second key feature of this game, uh, of this game design framework, uh, which is that the game actions themselves should be meaningful. Um, meaningful in two ways, meaningful for the assessment. So the kinds of stuff that players are doing in the game needs to connect meaningfully <laughs> to the target concepts that we want to assess. But it also needs to be meaningful to the players, right? It should be stuff that they're interested in. It should be stuff that they care about. So they're actually invested in the kinds of actions that they're, that they're <clears throat> doing as part of the game. <clears throat> so players, I mentioned the players uh, query information about listeners' interests. And they get to do this by looking at various line graphs, bar graphs, heat maps of what listeners are, are, are into in various kind of fictional boroughs of this fictional New York City. They can find out if particular music genres or, or moods or song topics are, are popular in an area or if they're trending in various ways. And then they can use this information to make decisions about what kind of song is likely to generate revenue, uh, new fans, or even have sort of a, a higher place on these kind of music charts that, that we have out here. But, you know, this is an assessment game. And so, you know, you might expect what we'd be doing is like trying to test whether or not they're making the right decisions each time. But we're not into that. We're, we're more interested in trying to understand the process that students are going through uh, to use data to make those decisions. So our focus is on that decision making process. What choices did you make? And was that a reasonable choice? Was that choice connected to the data that was available to you at the time? To this end, uh, Beats Empire includes a prediction mechanic where players actually can indicate while they're making choices about what kind of song uh, they, want to, they want to record here. Uh, they can indicate whether or not a particular song feature is, is uh, the most popular in an area, whether it seems to be trending up. Uh, and then the system that's sort of capturing the data behind the scenes here is also able to connect that choice that the players have made to the existing data of the system to figure out whether or not that was a meaningful choice or whether that was a, a excuse me, a thoughtful choice. The player gets feedback from that, once they release the song, they find out whether or not that prediction that they made was correct. And if it was, they are rewarded with, you know, in-game currencies like fans or, or, or uh, in-game money. And then that sort of in turn encourages them to keep kind of exploring the data as they make these decisions when they play the game. But players make decisions for all sorts of different reasons. And it's not always uh, data that's part of those decision-making. And that, that should matter to us. That matters to us in the way in which we designed this game. We wanted the game to be meaningful to players and so we also wanted them to be able to set their own goals. We wanted to be able to set their own definitions of success in the game uh, and, and ultimately to create a music studio that felt like it represented their interests. So for example, we found early on that players kind of tinkered with this connection between the artists and the song mood and topic and the title. Uh, here you're kind of seeing, uh, Beyonce had released the album Lemonade around the time we were doing some of these tests. And of course, this is a fantastic album. The students were really interested in it. And so, you know, if students want to uh, uh, hire Beyond Day, our, our own sort of fictional version of Beyonce in this game world all the time, great. If they want her to only record, record angry love songs, absolutely. That makes a great album. We all know that now. So that should be a, a, a choice that's supported in the game because it's a meaningful choice to the players. So that was an important sort of design feature of this game as well. And then the last feature of this game-based formative assessment framework uh, is that the data should be actionable. So in our system, we, we really don't believe that the system should be doing the work of the educator. Uh, the educators know the, the, the students well, uh, they're, they're experts in their craft. And so instead, what our goal is, is to, to find ways to get the information that the teacher wants and needs in an understandable way, and then to give them the space uh, to act on it. So let me show you a little bit about how we go about doing that. So first of all, you don't have to dig too deep in this representation, but what it shows is 
the number of songs that students uh, are releasing. And then and the blue line is the number of times that they're releasing songs and also looking at the data screens. So what you see here is you see like a wide range of gameplay. And that's exactly what we want for a formative assessment game because we expect uh, students are gonna be at all different levels of understanding of data and data analysis. So the game needs to be able to capture that gameplay across that wide continuum. We can zoom in though on, on particular students here. So for example, we, we see Alyssa, the first uh, row there is the number of turns she takes through the game. Uh, the second is the number of songs that she releases. And the third row there is the time she looks at the data screen, the insight screen. Um, and so Alyssa's doing pretty well. She's moving through the game at a reasonable pace. She's releasing songs, she's looking at data. This is kind of what we're aiming for. This is sort of the optimal way in which we might hope students play the game. Uh, but we also have Krista and we also have Daniel, right? Now, Krista hasn't taken very many turns. Um, she's you know, kind of seen the data screen, but she's sort of moving really pretty slowly through the game. In contrast to that, you have Daniel, who's like churning through the game. He's like releasing songs like constantly. He's going through turns constantly, but he's not really looking at the data screen, right? Now, we don't know exactly why these students are doing what they're doing. Uh, but we know what they're doing. So what we want to do is we want to communicate that information to the teacher. And we do this through a live dashboard that the teacher has access to while the, the students are playing the game. And here we can, for example, communicate that Krista seems stuck. We don't know why Krista's stuck. She may be confused about data. She may be, uh, she doesn't know what button she's supposed to press next. She may think the game's boring. You know, any of those three are possible. Uh, but we can, we can sort of flag Krista to the teacher and say, hey, you might want to check on Krista and see if she needs help. She seems to be stuck somewhere. Likewise, we can uh, notify the teacher that Daniel, he's playing the game, but he's not looking at the data screen. Maybe he just doesn't know where the data screen is. Maybe he doesn't know why he needs to look at the data screen. There's all sorts of possible reasons why. So again, <clears throat> we want to flag that to the teacher and just say, hey, go check on Daniel, make sure he knows where the data screen is. Maybe talk to him about how he could use it as he plays the game. So all of this is about just trying to communicate to the teacher what students are doing in the game and then give them information that they can act on. But in addition to knowing whether or not students are playing the game, we also want to know that they're using data, right? So here's another kind of messy representation that I'll just quickly explain. The top kind of collection of bars here shows uh, song releases where players either don't really look at the data screen when they release a song or they do um, excuse me, they don't make a prediction when they release a song or they do make a prediction, but they make an incorrect prediction. So we have a kind of a group of students that are not really making um, um, correct predictions about how data is related to their, to their song choices. The second group are students that are making uh, those decisions that are doing pretty well. If they're green, it means that they've made a decision uh, that is meaningfully connected to the data that was available to them. Their prediction was meaningfully connected. So we have that group of students that are that are doing pretty well with the data. And then we have this third group on the bottom, maybe started out not using data very much or not using it very well, but over time, they're getting better at using data and making meaningful decisions with data in the game. So again, two things to point out here. One is that, that we have a broad range of players and, and their use of data in the game. And that's, again, what we want for a formative assessment game is to capture all of the space of possibilities here. Uh, and then two, we want to figure out how can we communicate this ugly, this messy representation to teachers so they can do something with it. Uh, and that we can do again through the, the dashboard. We can, we can show sort of here kind of collections of students that might be struggling in various ways, but we can also zoom in on a particular student showing the ways in which, uh, in this case, Ella, uh, might be successfully making decisions with data or not for each for each song release. So teachers can drill in as, as detailed as they want about individual students or sort of stay at a more kind of classroom level. But we also want to provide those actionable, uh, we, we also want to suggest actionable uh, uh, actions. <laughs> we want to suggest actions for the teacher to take, right? And that, as I said before, could be checking in on a student to make sure that they know where the data screen is. But also it might be to say like, look, a lot of the students are only using the bar graph and it might be good to review in your class the difference between a bar graph and a line graph um, so that they, you can kind of you know, reevaluate that, that uh, area of, of, of the topic. So all of this again is about trying to think about how can we capture how students are thinking with and using data and how can we communicate that information uh, to teachers so that they can uh, modify their practice uh, to help students learn about data and data analysis.
and that's Beats Empire. Uh, you're welcome to go check it out and play it sometime. Um, it's fun. Ho hopefully you, <laughs> hopefully you think so as well. Uh, it's also open source. So if it's something you want to look at, you want to sort of dig into more deeply in the code, you're, you're of course welcome to do that. Um, as I mentioned, our goal here was to support New York City teachers and students as they're beginning to explore data in their math science and computer science classrooms. Um, and I think Beats Empire offers a really nice way of doing that. It, it provides an opportunity for all students to have this kind of encounter with data and data analysis. Um, um, and it expands opportunities for all students to, to think about these practices. But I think we also need to be asking for what? Like, why do we want people, why do we want all people to encounter computer science or data and data analysis? Um, to go back to these initiatives that are happening across the country, we say computer science for all, but what do we actually mean when we say for all? What's the, what's the key goal there? Um, I recently wrote a, a paper uh, with some colleagues, um, uh, Mike Tissenbaum, David Weintraub, and Tammy Clegg, uh, that argued that rather than seeing these computer science for all initiatives as ways to funnel all children into software engineering, which many of these initiatives seem to be doing, um, we should instead be asking, you know, what kind of computer science can we, can we create or can we imagine that meets the needs of all the different kinds of people and jobs and, and places people might want to go, right? What does a computer science for the scientist mean? What does a computer science for the artist look like? What does a computer scientist for the activist look like? Um, our exploration of STEM practices and tools and ideas needs to be uh, about moving from you know, as is said here, the acceptance of one's given reality to the possibility of changing it. How can we create educational experiences that not only put learners in contact with STEM ideas and practices, but also push back on what counts as STEM, push back on what STEM can create and what STEM can do. Uh, and that brings me to this next kind of area uh, of interest, which I call kind of future making. So many of you may be familiar with uh, Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby, uh, and they articulated this practice that they'd been engaged in and many other artists have been engaged in over the years that they called speculative design. Uh, speculative design is about you know, building these provocative futuristic artifacts or experiences or systems that could very well come about based upon the, the state of science and technology as it exists today. So this is a way of critiquing the present by building possible and probable futures. Right? Um, now, I had the fortune of having these, these great conversations about speculative design uh, with my, my colleague, Mike Dando at St. Cloud State University, and also John Jennings, who is a brilliant award-winning comic book artist uh, and scholar at the uh, University of California, Riverside. And he was, he was talking with us about the ways in which he was thinking about speculative design in his practice. And the three of us together just kind of kept circling around to this idea that, yeah, but like, that's just good pedagogy. Shouldn't good pedagogy, shouldn't education be about future making? Shouldn't we be engaging young people and imagining and building the future by critically reflecting on the state of things today, the state of society, our society, the state of our technology as well. Um, inviting young people to ask about how the conditions of today might constrain the possible futures that we can create or to start thinking about possible futures that might overcome the challenges that we face today. And also importantly for our conversation here, you know, in, how can we invite young people to do this and specifically young people that often are not encouraged to imagine futures that center themselves to begin asking these questions. So from this, we designed this project that we called Remixing Wakanda. This was a series of workshops that we conducted uh, where we invited black teen women from the community around where I live and work to engage in speculative design practices. Uh, and during this project, the girls were invited to use a lens of Afrofuturism to imagine future societies and technologies that center people of color. Now, before I get too much further in this project, I wanna just sort of check in about Afrofuturism. So if you're not familiar with this, this is a genre of literature, art, and music that centers the African diaspora's experiences, aesthetics, and histories. And this is a, a very radical act, okay? Because the diaspora's histories were explicitly and intentionally deleted over centuries of the slave trade. So when we invite these young women to play with Afrofuturism, we're doing more than just making sci-fi we're talking about how awesome the Black Panther movie is, right? We're trying to invite them to dig into their past, to reflect on how their histories, their cultural values, their family practices, um, their ways of seeing and acting in the world, make them who they are today. And also to, to think about how that knowledge, how those histories can point directions forward 
for building a future that actually represents and values those perspectives and those histories. This is a cycle of connect, reflect, and project that we called uh, critical constructionist design. And um, I'm going to talk to you about how this framework was kind of implemented in the project and how it sort of showed up in the kinds of things that the girls did over the course of this project. So for the project, we had five um, black girls invited by their art teacher uh, at a public school in the neighborhood around uh, where Columbia University is located. Uh, these girls came and hung out with us about once a week for four hours, uh, each session for eight weeks. And myself and my student, uh, uh, Issa Cray, who I, I forgot to mention her name earlier, but uh, she was sort of a core part of this project. She and I were sort of facilitators for the, for the project, but we realized right away that it didn't make sense for us to sort of be leading uh, these young women in reflecting on their experiences as black women. I mean, I'm neither black nor a woman. And so I, I don't really have any business sort of telling them what they need to think about or what they need to be designing, right? So, so the first thing we did is we really uh, very intentionally kind of pushed ourselves to the edges uh, throughout these experiences and tried to sort of center the girls and their experiences, um, center the girls as experts of their own experiences. Uh, we did that through a variety of ways of kind of organizing the space um, and, but we just sort of made ourselves available for conversation, for bouncing ideas off of, connecting them to sort of materials and, and tools that they might want to use. Uh, and, and the other thing that we did that was really important here is that we invited uh, guests, artists, scholars, and activists, uh, Black uh, men and women, to come into each of these sessions and engage the girls in things like what is Afrofuturism? Uh, what is it like to be Black in New York City? You know, these, these kind of really important and, and intense conversations that they were more uh, well positioned to have with the young women. We collected a lot of different kinds of data. Uh, we had a lot of interviews with them kind of collectively. Uh, I did interviews individually with them as they were building to talk about their process and talk about what they were creating. And then of course, if you've done this kind of work, you know that you have lots and lots of photographs and video of all the cool things that are being made uh, over the course of the time. What I wanna do now is I wanna sort of walk you through some of these, the aspect of the critical constructionist design framework to show you how it uh, was implemented in the project. So the first piece of this was to encourage the participants to connect with the past, to reflect on, uh, and also to elevate their personal and their family histories as valid sources of STEM knowledge and STEM development. One way we did this at the very beginning was we invited the participants to design uh, a passport. Now a passport is you know, a representation of yourself. It, it marks you as an individual and, and all the details about you, but it also connects you to a broader community. And so uh, similarly to the kind of passports we all kind of carry around, we asked them to sort of design a representation of themselves. Um, uh, many of the girls sort of wrote nicknames on them. They, they wrote in sort of zip codes that they belong to. They used the, uh, we had sort of endinkra symbols sort of around the room. They used some of those to represent different values that were core to who they are. Um, one of the girls drew this, this, you can sort of see in the middle there, drew this beautiful hibiscus flower. And she told us a story about how when she was growing up uh, in, the, in the island of Dominica, uh, she would go outside and there was these hibiscus flowers all over the place and she sort of snapped their stems and used the sap as glue on her art projects. And so by drawing this, this flower as part of her passport, she was trying to represent herself not only um, as, as a, a citizen uh, of Dominica, but also an artist. And this sort of connected across those two, those two spaces of how she saw herself. These pieces, as I said, are not only about representing the individual, they're also about representing their belongingness to a community. And so the, each passport was uh, a shape that tessellated so they could bring their individual passports together to make a larger piece of art that represented them together as a community. Um, this connection to the past, this importance of family history is something that came up throughout the entire project. Um, Ada is another example of this. She was really interested in sewing and, and she got really passionate about learning to sew well. Um, she was building this incredibly beautiful uh, African cloak. Uh, it was a very fashionable design. It had this sort of not yet tech to, to, to sort of represent the wearer's identity, you know, through some sort of like a sand display system. Uh, it included all this, these batteries of sensors that would also kind of monitor the health and the safety of the wearer. Um, she was really invested in this design. She was getting really excited about it. And she went home to ask her mother uh, if she could borrow some fabrics. It turns out her mom is a fashion designer. And so she asked her mom if she could borrow some of her African fabrics and her mom very quickly said, no, <laughs> no, you can't. She said, you don't even know how to sew. Um, Ada was, you know, a little annoyed perhaps, but she wasn't deterred. 
uh, she came back to the lab the next week. She told us the story she, and she just like really focused on learning to sew. She spent time uh, using our uh, African inspired fabrics that were certainly not as good as the ones that her mother had, but she used those to sort of practice her sewing by hand, practice sewing with the machine. And she built this beautiful, beautiful cloak over the course of the project. And as she was finishing it up, um, I asked her if she if she's told her mom about it. She showed her mom this, this cool thing that she's making. And she's like, no, not yet. <laughs> she said she wanted to wait until it was completely done. And then she could show up and be like, boom, see, you said I couldn't do it, but I did. This, this kind of need to show this skill of sewing was a way of kind of representing this value and connecting to this, this existing sort of family practice and this value um, that, was, that was present in her life. And also potentially a way of kind of gaining access to currently inaccessible knowledge about this skill and this practice, as well as the, of course, the resources of the, of the materials themselves. So connecting to the past was really important for this project, not only at the beginning, but also throughout. We also asked the participants to reflect on the present, to think about uh, existing challenges, existing issues that they experience, um, and also really encourage them to reflect on these, these issues as they feel them locally and as they feel them personally. Um, the artist Stacy Robinson came and joined us early in the project. He's, a, he's also a really celebrated Afrofuturist artist. And he talked to the girls about what Afrofuturism is, why it's an important uh, genre of design. Uh, and he also talked to them just about what it's like to be a black teen in New York City. We encouraged the girls to uh, reflect on their strengths, reflect on you know, their superpowers, uh, the superpowers of their community as well, but also to identify some of the villains that they find themselves facing, some of the systems and barriers that, that sort of keep them from thriving in the way that they would like to. And the girls identified, you know, not surprisingly, a host of barriers, a host of challenges. They identified the racism that they experience on a daily basis. They, they uh, described, you know, real concern for the physical and the mental health of their themselves and of their family members. But they were also all really interested in the environment. And each of them talked about the environment quite a lot in our conversations. And three of the five chose to create projects that explicitly address the relationship between humans and the environment. Mina is a really nice example of this. She really loves nature. She talks a lot about how she likes to go um, you know, outside of the city into the mountains, into the woods and spend time in nature. But she also kind of like guiltily confessed that she also really loved living in New York City. She loved the big buildings. She loved the lights. Um, she liked the energy of it. And so for Amina, there was a real tension between this trade-off of creating these beautiful, these big and, and interesting cities and also finding a way to protect the environment, finding a way to live kind of in communion with the environment. For her, the challenge that she wanted to encounter, that the challenge she wanted to explore in her design was this one of coexistence. And so with Mina and with all the others, we asked them to think about what kind of futures could we create? What kind of futures could we imagine that would center their experiences, center their, their perspectives and values, and also even you know, their aesthetics? How can you make something that looks like something you, you would love and something you would be passionate about? Uh, once again, we encouraged the girls to think about these, um, these futures that they could design by centering them on the local, um, by reflecting on what their community might look like or smell like or taste like or sound like in the future, think about new kinds of technologies or new kinds of systems that could address those concerns that they had and that they experienced uh, you know, in the present. Um, Jalise is a nice example because you know, as we talked about all these different issues that were coming up, she, she really kind of clicked into the idea that these are all interconnected issues, that you know, the environment, racism, social unrest, these are all interconnected. And so she chose to design a city uh, an entire city because she felt that was the best way she could represent the way in which these issues were connected together. She was inspired by the artist Kingales and she used uh, all these uh, everyday materials and found objects and she sort of designed and then eventually built this very large uh, city that, that uh, used emerging as well as kind of not yet technologies to showcase how people could live together and also how they could live in harmony with nature. So for example, the, the farm community you know, produces bio waste. How could that bio waste be harvested and then sort of recycled and used to generate energy? Uh, the buildings had gardens on the roofs. The skyscrapers had a, some sort of a glass-like substance that she imagined that could collect solar energy and then again, you know, reconvert it to be used again. Every aspect of her city was interconnected so that the city itself was self-sustaining uh, and the environmental resources that were necessary for that city's existence would also be protected. 
and her city was clearly inspired also by her home country of Dominica. It leveraged the colors of the flag in the streets and in the buildings, and it used African patterns and textiles throughout. Jalisa's city, I think, provided a really you know, interesting vision of a future, as well as pointing towards specific technological and scientific innovations that could potentially bring it about. It could bring it into being if only we would value social harmony and nature in the same way that she does. So the projects that these girls created as part of the Remixing Wakanda project, I think, shows us that part of the solution to the many problems that we're facing today as a society is first trying to imagine, imagine a future where these problems have been solved. Um, not by you know, pretending they'll go away on their own or not by ignoring them, but by leveraging the existing and powerful STEM ideas and practices uh, like data science, like computational power, uh, creating new technologies and new scientific practices and doing that by elevating these voices, these perspectives and these histories uh, of young people that are often kind of left out of these conversations. And I really think that in that way, we can move forward from thinking of STEM as, as sort of a, a way of stabilizing society as it currently exists. And instead thinking about these practices and these tools as, as ways of identifying and dismantling inequitable and oppressive systems that exist. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's what my students and I are thinking about uh, all the time in the Snow Day Learning Lab. It was a real pleasure to share with you this, this little snippet of some of the projects that we're doing. Um, I'd be happy to take questions and, and chat with you more about all this. <laughs> I like it, the visual clap. Don't everybody talk at once. Hi, Nathan. It's good to see you. Hey, thanks. it's great to see you. Yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. It's really wonderful to see kind of see the summary of your work that you've been kind of putting together. I'm curious what's next, like what you're, what are some of the things that you're hoping to do next? I know you're on sabbatical, so maybe that's <laughs> what you're kind of simmering on, but I'm curious what, um, what threads that you might pursue from these projects or new projects that are emerging. Yeah, I mean, well, what's next is like you said, I'm on sabbatical, it's going to the pub, that's next, but um, <laughs> further into the future. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things that, that I'm wanting to do and some that we've already started. So on the first thing I'll mention is this remixing Wakanda project. We, we did this, this first version of it and felt it was really um, uh, exciting. We felt like there was a lot to learn from what we did. We also know that our particular instantiation of this might look differently in a different location, a different group of students, you know, whether that's in New York or somewhere else. And so we had grand designs of doing an implementation um, in Minnesota, uh, outside of Minneapolis, where my colleague Mike Dando uh, is, is working. But then this, this virus, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, this virus started spreading. So everything shut down. So we didn't get to continue doing our implementations um, of the Remixing Wakanda project. We're hoping to do another set of implementations of that either this summer or in the fall, you know, knock on wood. So that's one thing we want to kind of explore this further and try to refine this design um, framework for, for a broader range of possible um, situations and, and, and communities. Um, I have a couple other projects though that maybe I, I can quickly mention. One, uh, I'm, you know, I've told you I've been doing some work around data and data analysis, and I have a project that, uh, an NSF funded project that engaged uh, uh, students and teachers to kind of collectively come together to sort of flatten the hierarchies between teachers and students and invite them to work with professional data scientists to start using open source data to understand issues and challenges that, that exist in their local community, and then use that data to try to also, to, to try to also begin proposing potential solutions. Um, we did that project also again, right before and also, also during the pandemic. Um, and I'm really, it, it went really well, but one thing that I felt like we didn't quite figure out is how do we support um, these kind of teams of people doing, I think, really important and interesting uh, data analysis in communicating their findings to a broader audience. I mean, we can set up these like showcases where they talk to community leaders and all that stuff and everybody claps and everybody feels great about it, but then they all go home and they forget about it. And so we've been trying to think about how do we empower, um, uh, you know, these, these novice data scientists to also gain 
capabilities and skills and in communication and in, in widely disseminating what they're finding. So that's a new project that we're working on some proposals around. Um, and then I'll also just briefly mention my student Issa Correa, uh, who was you know core to the remixing Wakanda project. For her dissertation, she's been exploring biodesign, you know, making uh, in collaboration with biological organisms, uh, as opposed to thinking about you know nature as a thing that we can control, the thing that we can sort of mine for resources. How do we think about it as a collaboration between us and nature? How do we think of ourselves as part of nature? So um, that's some of the dissertation work she's doing, but we're starting to also write some proposals together around you know, designing new materials and also building new relationships with the community to, to do that bio design as well. So I'm, I'm excited to explore that space further as well. Hi, Nathan. I'm Emily Gleason. I'm a professor in the learning sciences in the School of Ed. Um, I loved your talk. It was great. Um, it really spoke to me in a lot of ways. I've been um, doing a lot of work sort of at the intersection of the, the realm you talked about today. I was part of the UC Lynx consortium for many years and the after school world doing making and tinkering um, yeah. with also my colleague, Jose Lizaraga. Um, who isn't here, but probably will be at some point. Anyway, um, I, lo I loved the ideas and the, and the way you put it all together. I'm wondering about the positionality piece, your positionality in relation to working with the population that you did and how you, how you negotiated that. We, we know positionality is always tricky and it you know, um, connects to issues of power and privilege. So I just wanted to hear you um, think that through a little bit. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, and thank you also for coming to the talk here today. Yeah, uh, thanks. It was great. Yeah, it, it, you're absolutely right. And it was something that was very forefront in my mind um, early on. I mean, I, I, um, I've been, I, I keep finding myself doing work um, in kind of communities of, of places uh, and, and people where I'm not one of them. And, and that's always a really kind of um, dangerous thing to do. Um, as I mentioned, you know, a, a important decision and important realization of that at the very beginning was just recognizing not only that I'm not, you know, a, a black woman, but also I, I've written about this in, in a, a journal article. I'm also sort of the antagonist of their story in many cases, right? Um, and, and recognizing that as a black man, like that, that's, that's a potential issue. And that's a potential conflict that has to be sort of acknowledged at the very beginning. So one thing we did at the very beginning was just acknowledge it. Like, let's just say it <laughs> in the room and say like, look, I recognize that, that there's a conflict here. There's a tension here. And we need to recognize it together. I need to be aware of it. I need to be cautious about it. You need to be aware of it. And you need to know that I'm aware of it. And we can try to kind of work through this together. Uh, another thing, as I mentioned in the talk, was pushing ourselves to sort of the edges, um, to thinking about how I could be available to be a resource, to be a sounding board for some of their ideas that they were coming up with, um, pointing them towards potential you know, resources and ideas, but ultimately uh, positioning them as the experts of, of those experiences and of their interests as well. Right, um, and and you know that that sort of decision was something we had to kind of make every single session, every single day that we came back together. How do we make sure that we're not the center of the tension here? How do we how do we make sure we're not driving the activities that happen in this space? And then the other thing, as I mentioned also in the talk, was was bringing other experts into the space that could speak more directly to the experiences um, of our participants. And so we had uh, men and women. Um, that are experts in all sorts of different fields uh, come and, and participate in the project, have conversations with the girls about their work and about their sort of uh, journey to that space as an expert. Um, and also to talk with the girls about their experiences and talk with the girls about the things that they were encountering on a daily basis. So, you know, I, the question is really an important one that you're asking. And, and I don't know that I have the full answer other than just like, you have to constantly be aware of it. You have to constantly sort of check those those power relationships and check yourself and your role in those, those power relationships uh, and try to find ways to, um, to make it explicit and then to sort of uh, alleviate it as best as you can. Thank you. These, these Zoom talks are so... Uh... <laughs> Do 
was like a silent barrier between us all the time. No worries, that's okay. I had another question, but I, I want to like make sure other people ask their questions. <laughs> hey, you gave them a chance. <laughs> I, I was just curious, like I, I really love, you know, this, uh, the perspective that education is future making. It totally is. And, um, and something that we've been curious about, uh, you know, and others here know that we work a lot with families um, and especially families from groups that have been marginalized from STEM and computing spaces. And we've been curious about kind of featuring, um, uh, featuring experiences and social dreaming as well and, and the possibilities with that. And something that we're just kind of, um, attention that we're noticing, and maybe it's because we're still novices with engaging people and, and kind of featuring experiences is how, you know, what what's it like to engage groups of people in social dreaming and in featuring while also kind of still being present <laughs> with the current challenges yeah. uh, that they have? And how how does how do you reconcile that as a group? You know, when the program is over, um, I think we we run into that generally with just workshops in general. Like, what happens if you know when it's over? But I'm just curious how that's something. Um, how do you how do you like end the experience when when it's so future oriented? Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's a great point. Um, well, I mean, I only have. I don't have the solution, obviously, but but I, it's 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 something I've been thinking about as well. I mean, I mentioned in the data project we've been thinking about how we can help these participants kind of communicate their their findings beyond the the project itself. We also had that same set of questions around this project. We finished it, and these girls had built these just amazing amazing artifacts that we were so excited about. We're like, we got to show the world. <laughs> yeah, this is so incredible, and so we organized some like kind of. I tried, tried to sort of create a, I called a bunch of the art galleries in the area and I was like, you need to have an exhibition of these girls work and we're going to do it. And like I had the, all these ideas uh, and people were like, oh, I don't know. And we eventually kind of created some space, you know, at the, at the university for it. But, but I think really that's, that's the sort of second thing I want to figure out is like, how do you, how do you go beyond that workshop? Um, the, the sort of next round of, of implementations that we're doing, we're actually trying to pair the, exi the exhibition more directly to the workshop itself, so that so that the work so that the exhibition isn't some sort of after the fact like oh we should do this, but it's actually built into the process from beginning to end. So I think that's one thing that we're trying to explore is is how you know is to sort of create a space for them to not only have um, uh, the lab to work through and think through some of these issues, but also the platform to communicate them beyond that that the four walls of of the lab. Um, that's one way we're thinking about it, but we haven't we haven't gotten to implement it yet because everything sort of went on pause. But I think you're right. I think thinking about sort of supporting this, these experiences, but also the thinking that's a part of those, those future making experiences beyond the space is really important. Mark, I think you're asking a question, but you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I'm tr well, I don't know if I have a question. I've been trying to formulate the question in these silences and so far, <laughs> so I'll try. Um, so. First, I'm not a gamer, but once I did try to play that Beats game that you showed, Beats, whatever yeah. it's called, it was beyond me. And I'm sort of in awe of these kids who could actually make it work. But I guess that's their culture and not mine. Um, I guess the question is about authenticity, because mm -hmm. in a way, what you did was give them uh, a data science experience wrapped in something which they in their flavor. And so it sort of seems contrived. I mean, I guess it worked, but they didn't go on to run music studios or run performing artists. So that's sort of part one of the question. And then the back side of that question, which I think I can't quite connect is, and did any of them go on to love data science or to become data scientists in some fashion? Or was this like a school activity that, or after school activity that, you know? So I, it's yeah. not well formed, but I bet you can answer it. All right, yeah, of course. I can also, I can definitely respond to that. So, you know, two, two thoughts. One is, and this is, don't think of this as a cop out. I guess you can decide it for yourself if you think it's a cop out. But, but one thing I would just say is, um, I spent a lot of time designing most of most of my time uh, in the game space, designing learning games. And this was a this was an assessment game, which is something I had not done before, and found out that it is very different than building a learning game. Uh, and 
and, and consequently the goals of this game were not to get you to be excited about data science. <laughs> they were to help the teacher know what you knew about data science. Um, so I'll just, I'll just note that I think if I was trying to build a game that was to kind of get people, like I think some kids might've gotten excited about data science in this game, but I, that certainly wasn't the goal. And if it was, I might've done some things a little differently. So I don't know if they did. Um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if it didn't. But the other part of this answer that I, that I think is worth noting is it actually is, I mean, the game is a contrived experience as, as all games really are in many cases, but, but, um, but the activity that the kids engage in as part of the game is not contrived. It's in fact a, a very um, uh, important part of the music industry today. Uh, and and to, to sort of prove it, my colleague, uh, Jeremy Rochelle was like, I'm gonna go talk to some of these data scientists. And he went out and he found that there was all these companies that are explicitly data science in the music industry companies. And they spend a lot of time analyzing uh, what people are listening to on Spotify, on YouTube. And then from that, they, they, they gain sort of insight into what various trends and what various kind of uh, new trends that are upcoming are, are likely to be. And then they communicate that to music studios. So this is a real job. And we actually recorded a little like five minute video talking to a lot of these uh, data scientists about what they do, showing what they do, uh, talking about why, why they got interested in it. Uh, and then we use that also as kind of a, a resource for the teachers that they could sort of share with their students if they would like. So um, I think, I, think I've, I was surprised at how real this particular set of activities actually is, um, even though we sort of fictionalize it in a lot of ways for the game itself. Um, but it turns out it is a pretty, a pretty important use of data science these days. And do you think the kids got it, the, that this is an authentic experience? I mean, you get it, did they? I mean, I, I think so. We didn't, uh, I'd have to go back to look at the interview data specifically to see, you know, how, how we talked to them about that, that exact question. Um, you know, I know they were really into the game and, and, you know, people say this all the time when they build educational games, like, ah, kids loved it. Um, and maybe, you know, whatever, but uh, some, some, let me give you a, a very specific example that I just, it's, it's, it's anecdotal. So maybe it doesn't mean anything, but it means a lot to my heart. And that was when I was, uh, we implemented this in a classroom and kids uh, were sort of sitting at their individual tables with their headphones in. Um, they, they sort of playing on their laptop. They were usually sort of near somebody else. And there was this one pair that every time they would be about to release a song, they'd like nudge their friend. They'd pull out their headphone. They put the headphone in their other friends. They hit the go button and they'd both be like, <laughs> it's just start grooving to it. And, and so like we saw lots of little examples like that. We saw people logging into the game after class was over and when they got home throughout the week uh, that they seemed to enjoy it. So I don't know if they bought it as being a real experience. I know they found, they found it fun. They found it enjoyable. And I think, you know, if it also then produces information for the teacher to get a sense of what students are learning about data and data analysis, then it sort of did the job that we designed it to do. Cool, thank you. Joel, speak up. I, Joel, I have up. A, a little follow-up to that. Um, the um, Hey, Nathan. <laughs> hey, good to see you, Joe. Yeah. Um, it's about with, taking into account that this was an assessment game and not a learning game. Um, so your aspirations might be limited by that. But it what you and Mark were just talking about raises the question for me of, what is your goal for the kind of who you would like these people who engage in the game to become? What would you, is, is part of your goal for them, some of them to think about becoming data scientists? Um, or if not, um, what, um, how would you formulate what your aim is for the kind of people you like them to become? Yeah, well, not surprisingly, and I, you know, I, uh, you know, I've had chances to talk throughout the years, and so maybe this won't come as a shock to you, but you know, not surprisingly, I want I want these students to see data as something that's actually useful for them, that that mm -hmm. helps them do the things that they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think, you know, as I kind of alluded to in the talk, I don't think that every kid is passionate about being a software engineer. Um, I don't think every kid is passionate about being a data scientist even. Um, but I do want, you know, the, the students that play the game to see that these types of practices have some use. Um, they might have some specific use in music, which is something that we found kids were really interested in. So maybe that's an outcome of it. 
But, you know, broad, broadly speaking, I would love for them to play and be like, oh, I didn't think about data as being as useful as it turns out that it is. <laughs> and so, you know, this is one little sliver of a kind of experience we might kind of provide to get at that. Um, the other project that I kind of alluded to, uh, which is called Make With Data, was mm -hmm. another one to say, like, how can you use data to solve problems in your neighborhood? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but I think I, I think that's sort of my goal, broadly speaking. Yeah. And that we haven't talked about it, but that very much matches the kind of goals that I have with these yeah. sort of data science-like initiatives. It's like one way I put it is sort of... Uh, data in everyday life and changing the way I, I think about, we think about its possibilities and usefulness and relevance um, for a broad range of activities, not yeah. just the one that's in the, um, whatever the particular um, project is. It happens so, to be, yeah, exactly. Thanks. We really have time for one more. If there's one more, I'll count silently to 10. I can go. I have a question. Yay. So thank you so much, Nathan, for your uh, awesome talk. And um, I'm Shinjita. I'm a research associate uh, at the Institute of Cognitive Science. I kind of do similar work, but I guess I, my question was more around, um, did you notice any gender differences uh, in the assessments? Like, I was curious if um, identifying some of those gender differences could uh, support the teachers in um, kind of making more equitable learning environments. So yeah, curious, did you find anything um, different based on girls versus boys and yeah. We didn't, we didn't find any, any large differences um, along those lines. Um, you know, maybe if we had done it with uh, more classrooms than the ones that we did, you know, and had a larger data set, we might've started to notice some differences. But in our particular um, uh, implementations that we did with a couple classrooms, we didn't notice any major differences there. Got it. Thanks. One thing I'll just, you know, maybe just to slide this in, it's Mark, you mentioned you had trouble kind of playing the game. One thing that we always find really interesting when we do this kind of work is that like, when we, we spend a lot of time talking to teachers about how this game can sort of fit into their existing practices and, and we talk with them about how they think it might work. And, and they're very, very worried that their students will not understand how to play the game. And they're like a little panicked before that first day. And, and we have ne we've never once had an issue with a student not knowing how to, they just, it kind of connects yeah. to sort of a, a culture that they're already, you know, deeply engaged in. And so, um, you know, girls and boys alike were, were they played the game. They were excited by the game. They, they were comfortable with the game. Some of them may not have liked, you know, I mentioned this, this one, that one uh, participant that didn't go through many turns. I don't know if she didn't like the game or if she just got confused, but uh, it certainly seemed to be something that kind of appealed broadly to the students. And I think the music framing really mattered a great deal there. It wasn't just a game. It was also this, this kind of set of activities and set of topics that they were, they were talking about together across the board. Yeah, no, I believe it. I mean, I'm completely from a different era and a different, yeah, together. Yeah. Nathan, you've earned your trip to the pub. Thank you <laughs> very, very much. Appreciate it. And uh, we've recorded this, so other people may be watching it in the next few days. Great. Thank you very much Thanks. for having me. It was a pleasure to talk with you all today. Thanks, folks. See ya. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.